What in the world happened to Christian art? How did we go from these to these? Or from this to stuff like this? Or how did we go from Handel and Bach to just singing, oh, a lot? Which, granted, is still better than na, 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 na of a decade ago. Our churches are stripped of art, and our homes are full of horrible art. And Christian art basically means heartfelt garbage these days. And there are certainly powerful songs, great architecture, and amazing paintings still being created. But Christianity has seemingly been flooded by either bad art or a complete aversion to art entirely. We used to sponsor great art, to lead the world in it even. Now we run from it, stripping our sanctuaries of all images, building giant unadorned boxes to house our worship. What happened? Well, answering that is rather complicated, actually, because Christianity has quite the troubled history with art. Early Judaism interpreted the prohibition on idolatry to refer to all created images. And early Christianity accepted that, not incorporating any images into worship. The only art form allowed in early Christian worship appears to have been music. But two factors changed that. First, the Greek and Roman cultures that Christianity quickly assimilated into were highly artistic. And second, this familiarity with art found an unexpected expression when Christianity came under heavy persecution. Believers began looking up to those who had died for the faith, and images began appearing of the fallen martyrs as ways of remembering them. Over the centuries, this obsession with images of martyrs and saints only grew, especially taking off after the 6th century. By the early 700s, art was everywhere. Images of Mary, Jesus, the apostles, saints, martyrs, you name it. But some odd beliefs came along with the rise in art. People believed that the virtues of the person seeped into the image of that person over time, and so any affection shown to the image they felt was rightly expressed to the person whose image it was. This meant that images of God were being worshipped because the people felt that the worship went to God, not the image. And in a similar way, images of saints were receiving veneration regularly, kissing or touching the images as a way of showing affection to the individual. And at the same time, this focus on images also encouraged other arts, sculpture, architecture, poetry, the works. And this might have gone on for quite a while, but Christianity was being attacked by the rising force of Islam at the time. Muslims were telling Christians that the reason that Islamic armies were winning was because they had been sent to punish the Christians for what Muslims saw as the Christian sin of idolatry, worshipping images. To a beaten army and a terrified emperor, this sounded just plausible enough to be worth following up on. And so in 726 CE, Emperor Leo II ordered the worship of images to stop. Then four years later, he ordered their removal and destruction. Murals were whitewashed, paintings burned, an enormous painting of Jesus was removed from over the gate of the imperial palace, which was so unpopular that the people who took it down were murdered by an angry mob because of it. A synod 25 years later made the case that because no image can fully encompass the divine, then therefore every representation is necessarily heresy. And as far as it goes, that's true. We paint God through a lens of the world we know. It's why the Last Supper is painted as a bunch of white guys eating European food, after all. This new hatred of images was backed up by a refocusing of the command against idolatry, now expanded against all images, period. Unfortunately, while they destroyed the images, they didn't stop the veneration of the saints that led to the problem in the first place. And with nothing to connect them to the saints anymore, the people returned to images. A new council was held in 787, which said images can be conduits of worship without being idolatrous. But of course, almost immediately after, another emperor reversed that, and Christianity was caught in a seesaw of opinion. One decade, images would be promoted as integral to bringing us into the worship of God. And the next, the makers of those same images would find themselves beaten or even killed and their paintings destroyed. This went on until 843 when images were finally accepted as being helpful representatives and not idolatrous imitations of the divine. 
This made sure that there was always a market for the arts, even in dark times. Churches that had images of saints and murals of Jesus wanted spectacular music to go with them, statues, poetry, writings of all sorts. The church was the sponsor of the arts. This brought a great deal of good with it, as we'll talk about next week, but it also caused problems. The church spent an absolutely incredible amount of money on art. So much money, in fact, that it necessitated the indulgences that sparked the Protestant Reformation. So, Perhaps it isn't surprising that while early reformers like Luther didn't worry about images, the next wave, like Calvin and Zwingli, certainly did. They attacked the whole saint worship trade and started the same artistic attacks in 1523 as it happened a hundred years earlier. The statues went, the paintings, the fancy instruments in worship, the poetry, you name it. Everything artistic was painted with the same brush. It's wasteful, frivolous, idolatrous, and so was removed. And it is that mentality towards art that evangelical America has inherited. Not a healthy understanding that worship of art is bad, but the feeling that somehow art itself is decadent or wrong. Instead of finding a middle ground where we celebrate how art can strike the heart and jar the mind in unique ways, without encouraging the worship of art itself, many Christians have just abandoned art entirely. Except for worship music, many churches embrace a barrenness of artistic expression. Or, if there is art, it's almost purposely bad art. Something maybe for kids, but nothing that anyone would take seriously as worshipful or significant. And that's a shame, because while it can be wasteful when taken to extremes and idolatrous if misused, art can also reach us in ways that a thousand sermons can't. But that is the subject of next week's video. I mentioned a couple of different things in this video that I've already talked about. So if you want to take a look at the role that indulgences and the love of money played in the Protestant Reformation, this link right down here. And if you want to check out more of this series from the beginning, check out the link right there, hopefully. Until then, as always, thank you for watching. Have a great week. See you next Friday.